Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good to see all of y'all that are going to join us online here in just a few minutes. And we're fixing to get cranked up and get started here. Um, Maria, I have failed to bring the offering bowl out of the Sunday school office. Would you mind grabbing that for us, please, if you don't mind? So it's good to see you. I see a few of y'all popping on. So we're glad to be back in the building this morning. We're so excited to be back in the building this morning. Praise the Lord. And uh, so... Uh, Lord willing, we're going to we're gonna plow on through this thing with the Lord's help. Amen. Amen. We do want to go to Lord in prayer this morning. We have uh, quite a few that we need to continue to remember in prayer. Um, right before I popped on, uh, Brother Chris was talking about a, a, a Baptist missions director that he had been talking to. And that kind of immediately made my mind go to our missionaries. Um, we have a number of missionaries right now who are... Um, for lack of a better term, they are displaced uh, due to regulations. Uh, we have even some that are very near and dear to my heart uh, <laughs> that are unable to get back home right this minute. And um, so we need to pray for them, pray for favor. Um, we have some that have been out of, the, out of their, their country of ministry for um, well over a year now, unable to get back where they need to be. Um, so we just need to pray for our missionaries. It's a, it's a very trying time for them. And um, I will just say this, having missionaries in our own household and being able to see firsthand some of the things that they are going through during this particular time, trying to navigate ministry and navigate all the rules and regulations is a difficult thing. So let's pray for our missionaries for sure. We want to uh, continue to remember the, the Ferry family and the loss of Brother Johnny this week um and uh, of course miss miss peggy needs to be lifted up and pam and james and jennifer and doug and that whole family need to um to remember them before the lord and also um some of you may have already seen it posted this morning but um sister nell jacob's sister-in-law this was uh brother doug's sister pat has battled cancer for a long long time she has not battling anymore this morning and uh she has has finished her race and uh, finished it well, and we have no doubt she's in the presence of the Lord today, but this family's hurting today, so let's remember her. Um, and then also, we want to continue to lift up Buford and Debbie Golden. Um, they need miracles. They just need miracles, and we serve a miracle-working God. Amen? So we want to lift them before the Lord and ask for intervention there and for those families. And um, we also sent out a, a prayer request yesterday about Casey Skelton, Miss Sissy's um, son, we were originally, we originally thought he had fallen from a roof yesterday. He actually didn't fall from the roof. He fell onto the roof um, and, and had some, um, some health issues that caused that to happen. He, uh, he was discharged yesterday evening. He is doing better, but they need some guidance and some direction there. So let's continue to pray for that family. And then um, our lost loved ones. How many of y'all have lost loved ones? Need, need Jesus. And if ever there's a time when people need Jesus, it's right now. Amen. We want to lift our nation, uh, our leaders on both sides of the fence. We want to lift our leaders to the Lord. Um, our nation is facing a very critical week. None of it's caught God off guard. Amen. So let's pray accordingly. Let's pray as such and uh, ask that the Lord would help us. Uh, as his hands and feet and as, as his voice here on earth uh, to help us to navigate this and to do all things for his glory. Amen. That's what we want to do. Anybody else have another prayer request? Uh, well, I have a praise report. Let's, let's just go through. <clears throat> praise report is we are good. We are on the beat. Praise the Lord. Continue to remember him. Anybody else this morning? He is yes. He's not back in Alabama, but he's he's at his daughter's in Georgia, and so that's a that's a miracle right there. We're praising the Lord for that. God has really touched him. So let's continue to remember them and several others that have been in the hospital with COVID or home 
doing much better. Um, so let's let's continue to remember them. <clears throat> Okay. Had an opportunity to minister to her. Amen. Y'all continue to pray for our dear friend Curtis that comes and visits us on a regular basis. Um, he had surgery this week, so we want to continue to remember him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you today. God, you are so awesome. And Lord, I am thankful today that regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our situations, God, you hear us. We can call on you and you will answer us. God, you love us in spite of ourselves. God, you make ways where there seems to be no way. You are so, so, so good, Lord. And we stand this morning just in awe of you and who you are. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to come back together in this building, Lord, that we uh, can assemble ourselves together and learn of your word and worship together, Lord. And we thank you for that. And we lift up those this morning, Lord, that we have mentioned, Lord, in this room. God, there are so many needs today. Those that are still battling the effects of COVID in their body. Lord, we have, we have uh, Buford and Debbie, Lord, that need miracles, Lord, in their lives. Father, we ask that you would intervene in these circumstances. God, there are those that are still in the hospital that are struggling. There are those that are home that are struggling. Father, you see those that their hearts have just been torn apart this week through the loss of family members. God, and I'm so thankful that your precious Holy Spirit can also be a comforter. And we ask that you would do so in these moments, God. Those that need a physical touch, Lord, a healing in their body, Lord, would you speak that word? Lord, those that are going through discouragement, Lord, and despair, Father, would you be the lifter of their heads today? God, would you open doors of opportunity just like you did for Maria this week, Lord, to send people across our path or send us across people's paths that we need to minister to, God. And Lord, this week as our nation continues in a path of turmoil and uncertainty, God, may we be through your Holy Spirit. May we be a stabilizing force. May your church rise to the occasion, God, and be that stabilizing force there. Lord, we lift our missionaries to you far and wide. God, you see the circumstances. You see the steps and the doors that need to open and close. And Father, we thank you for their willingness to serve in so many capacities. And we just pray your blessings upon them and, and make ways, Lord, where our doors need to be open. Father, we lift our lost family members to you today. God, asking that we would not grow weary in praying for them, Father, and that you would send people across their path that they would respond to. And Lord, we thank you that you've heard our prayers this morning. And God, as we open your word, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to rightly divide your word today. Jesus, that you would um, help us, Lord, to have a hunger for your word as never before. And God, as we look for the hope that is to come, Lord, in this new world that is promised, Lord, that we're studying about today. Father, I pray that that hope would spill over into every aspect of our lives. God, anoint pastor this morning as he brings the word. Anoint Trina and the worship team, Lord, as they lead us to your throne and worship today. Be with our Sunday school teachers this morning. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Okay, we have been doing a study in the book of Isaiah. And um, this is actually the last lesson in that series. Starting next week, we're going to go uh, into the book of Mark, which is a wonderful gospel to study. Um, I just love the book of Mark. Mark focuses more on the actual actions of what Jesus did. And so I'm looking forward to that. But today... We're going to wind up our study in Isaiah, and we're going to cover several passages, Isaiah chapter 61 and 62 and also 65, and we're going to be bouncing back and forth uh, between these um, as, the, as the morning goes on. But we're going to start in Isaiah 61, picking up in verse 1 right there. Our central truth today is that Jesus is going to return to judge the nations and welcome the redeemed. Man, are you part of the redeemed? Amen. Amen. I certainly hope so this morning. Um, our, our key verse today is found in 2 Peter 3.13. It says, We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's a mouthful promise. 
a mouthful of promise. We are looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, my brain began to churn in all sorts of other scriptures um, where I was just thinking about the fact of the situation that we find ourselves in, um, in, our, in our world today, the struggles that we're facing uh, politically, economically, uh, health-wise, all the struggles that, that we're facing right here. And I think we as a church are approaching things wrong. I think we have reached a point where we have become so much a part of the world that we forget we're not a part of this world, okay? And we're trying to solve spiritual problems with physical response. We're trying to solve spiritual problems with fleshly answers, okay? That's not going to work. That, is, that has never worked before, but we have lulled ourselves into a, a thinking that we've had this under control, thinking that we've had things. Is that, am I making sense with that? Okay, we're trying to respond to spiritual problems in the flesh, and that's not going to work. It's never going to work. So I began to think about scriptures that, that kind of reinforce the fact that this is not our home. This is not our home. We're looking for that new home. We're looking for that new world. Um, Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Peter's saying, don't get caught up in those things. Have you ever seen us more caught up in what's going on in the world? I'm not saying stick your head in the sand like an ostrich and ignore it. Okay, but we are so caught up in, in, in the world and, and, and the things of the, that are waging war against our soul, and we're so caught up in it. And Peter says, abstain from that. Romans 12, 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Isn't that what we're supposed to be about? The will of God. And then John 18, 36, this is Jesus saying this. He says, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. You remember the disciples were all caught up because they thought the Savior was supposed to come in and be a mighty warrior and establish mm. a kingdom. And he's saying, no, this, my kingdom does, is not here. So we think of all these verses coming up today and, and we recognize that, no, we are not of this world. So we've got to get our focus where it is supposed to be. Our focus is on the world to come. Now, we're going to get to the end of the lesson and we're going to say, that doesn't mean we're supposed to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. There's got to be a balance here, okay? But for the purposes of, of what we're going through today, we need to stop a moment and we need to recognize we're trying to battle in the flesh and we need to be battling in the spirit. We need to be battling on our knees, amen? How many of y'all have ever been to Gatlinburg? Pigeon Forge. Okay, you know the, the strip where you're coming into the main part of, of all of the attractions and everything, and you're coming down, I can't even call the highway, I should be able to, but you're coming right smack dab down the middle of Pigeon Forge. And you top this one hill, I, I think is where I can tell um, buildings, like you know where the Titanic, the Titanic Museum is, and you climb that hill, and you get to the top of that hill just past the Titanic Museum, and all of a sudden you see this gorgeous mountain range right there. And it is so big and so massive that you just feel like you could just reach out and touch it. It's just right there. It's just, I love that, that view as we're coming in. But then how many of y'all have continued to make the journey down that highway and you go all the way through Pigeon Forge and you go into Gatlinburg and then you go on through Gatlinburg and you get the winding trails right there and, and you're headed, fixing to head over Newfoundland Gap and you're headed to Cherokee, North Carolina. If you keep going, that's what's gonna happen. But you go up, and what is that up there? Uh, Clingman's Dome up there? Okay, when, you, when you're getting into those mountains and you feel like you can just reach and touch them, there's one, and there's one, and there's one, and they just look like you can reach out and touch them. But then the further you drive, you realize that that one that you thought you could reach out and touch was way out yonder. And when you get up to the top and, and you're fixing to head up over, over toward Clingman's Dome and you see that mountain range and that mountain range, you begin to realize how far away they really are. It's deceptive, okay? 
The mountains are there and you think you can touch them, but then as you get into it, you realize, well, yeah, there's one right here, but the one I'm seeing behind it, it's not immediately behind it. It's way out there. You know, it's just the way that we perceive it. Okay, so that kind of tells you what we're looking at today in this two-phase study of, of prophecy in Isaiah. It's two stages. Right now we're in the in-between stage of what's going on right here. Jesus came and he fulfilled a lot of the prophecy that we have been talking about in Isaiah thus far, okay? But there's a whole lot more that has yet to be fulfilled. And when the people uh, that Isaiah is talking to, when the nation of Israel was listening to him, I am sure to them, it was just like those mountains. This is right here. This is fixing to happen. This is right here. But then as they began to walk this out, this faith out, they begin to walk it out. They realize that, yes, yeah, some of it is right here. But that other part that I thought was right here, uh-uh, it's way out there, okay? And so, you know, we've talked about that Isaiah's prophecies and so many of the prophets, they talk about present tense, but they also talk about future tense and what is to become. And that's what Isaiah is doing here, okay? Um, so, so we have to recognize that a lot of what we're going to study, we have parts of it that are already fulfilled, but we have other parts that have yet to be fulfilled. Okay, so let's pick up in, um, in Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Okay, so we just said the people of Isaiah's day did not realize that part of this was being fulfilled and part of this was far off, okay? Even Jesus' disciples did not understand this. We just talked about the fact they wanted his kingdom right then, and they didn't understand that his kingdom was not of this world. It, it was far off right there. So Jesus himself even begins to clarify the fact that, uh, that, you know, part of this is, is way off, part of it's now, part of it's way off, and he begins to kind of kind of try to prepare them for this. Um, so how does he do that, okay? Well, we're going to find another exact reference. If you flipped over to the book of Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, you're going to find that Jesus himself is speaking here. And what is he saying right here? Jump over there. Um, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. You got that, Jen? Read those two verses for me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay. Suddenly it stopped. Suddenly he stopped. Compare that to the verse we just read. Look back in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2. He says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's where Jesus stopped. What does Isaiah say? And the day of vengeance of our God. Why do you think Jesus stopped there? Why do you think he didn't come out and say, and the vengeance? Because he's talking about two different time frames here. Okay, he's talking that the vengeance was going to be for the, for the future. Jesus was worried about right here, right this moment. Okay, there was going to come a time when he was going to talk about and reveal the vengeance. And as we get further into the study, we're going, to, we're going to see where God is a God of judgment. Yes, but Jesus was putting emphasis on the fact of what he was going to do, what his mission is. Why am I here? His disciples were confused about this. So when Jesus repeats this, he's reminding you what he's here for. God's anointed me to preach the good news. He's anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted, to give liberty to the captives, to open the prison doors, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's why I'm here, is what Jesus is saying. That's what's happening right here in the immediate, okay? Now, when Isaiah's talking about and the day of vengeance, he had no way of knowing at that particular time that the day of vengeance was going to come way behind the other. Okay, so he's given the, the prophecy coming out, but that day was going to be coming in the future. Okay, 
On the future day, God will bring out about a season of divine judgment, and that will be when evil is going to be defeated forever, okay, and blessing is going to come. All right. Even verse 3 goes on in Isaiah 61 and talks about that. He says, to those who mourn, I will give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, an oil of gladness, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, okay? So he's talking about those things that are going to come. It, it's, you know, ashes were symbolic of deep mourning and deep grief, and oil and a, and a crown were, were signs of celebration. So he's saying, I'm going to take what's wrong in your life, I'm going to take what's bad in your life, and I'm going to replace it with what's good, ultimately. And so he's lining out, this is my mission, this is what I'm coming for right here. And so he's basically saying... God's people are going to be made strong. They're going to be made to endure. They're going to, I'm going to bring this to pass. So just basically he's saying, hold on. This is my purpose. This is why I'm coming. Okay? We're going to get there. God's people are going to be restored. Pick up in verse 4 through 9 and see what, what Isaiah goes on to say. He said, they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priest of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense and will make an everlasting covenant with them. Are you seeing a theme right here where he keeps talking about everlasting, everlasting, everlasting? Okay. Okay. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. Okay, when Isaiah is speaking of restoration of God's people, he's looking far into the future. Beyond just the restoration of the temple. Yes, we know the temple is going to be restored, but he's looking beyond that. He's talking to me, he's looking beyond any political restoration of a nation. Let me ask you this. What are we looking for? What are we looking for as, as followers of Christ? Have we become so caught up that we're looking to a political party or a specific person to give us our answers? You know? Isaiah was talking about something yet to come. He was, he, was, he was talking about something that has not yet come. We are so hung up, and, and y'all, I have, I have watched this and watched this, and I know this is online, and that's quite all right. I have watched and watched and watched as people that I thought were solid, strong Christians have become so caught up and so consumed in what is going on in the political realm of our nation that they can think of nothing else. They're so caught up and, and they're so, they're pinning their hopes on, on this. They're pinning their hopes on that. Well, what's going to happen on inauguration day? Well, what's going to happen a week from now? Well, what's going to happen? You know what? We're not of this world. We have to exist here. We have to live here. But we are not of this world. We talked about that at the very beginning. We are becoming so caught up in, in what's happening in our society. Folks, this has got to come to pass. This stuff has got to come to pass. We are living in a, in a prime, unbelievable opportunity to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Because these things have got to come to pass. I'm not standing here to preach doom and gloom. I'm saying the Lord's going to carry us through. Where are we going to put our where are we going to put our hope? Where are we going to put our heart? Where are we going to put our mouth? Okay? We and and this is Isaiah's talking about future things. He's talking about way out there. He's not just talking about the restoration of the temple. He's not just talking about Jerusalem. Okay? We're sitting here and we're worried what's going to happen to the United States. I understand that. Okay? You know, my, my daddy spent over 20 years active military. He loved this country. I am thankful today that he's not alive to see what's happening. You know, he would be so grieved. I love the United States. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I believe we're the greatest nation on earth still. But when it comes down to it, the focus and the purpose of Jesus Christ is not to spare the United States. You know, this is a kingdom thing. 
It's a kingdom thing. And we get so hung up on where I fit into this kingdom and we begin to worry about what we're going through. Am I making any sense here or am I just rambling this morning? Okay, we're so hung up on me, mine, and ours. It would be like Isaiah focusing only on Jerusalem. Now, we know that Jerusalem's pivotal in the, in the last days. We know that, okay? But it's not even just about Jerusalem, okay? It's a kingdom principle. And, and this is what Isaiah is pointing to. It's not just about political restoration of a nation. What's going on in the United States today is far more far-reaching than who's sitting in the White House. I've heard, I've heard those comments. I've heard those comments for years, you know, for years. It still comes down to, when you hear a comment like that, it still comes down to, I would venture to say, if that person is being facetious, maybe. But if that person is being serious, I would say that person does not have an understanding of kingdom principles. That person, you know, and no, I don't even know who it was. But I'm just saying, it, it pulls back to America's the pivotal. And we're not. We're not the pivotal, okay? It's not about America. It's not about what happens in the U.S., okay? It's a kingdom thing, and this is what we've got to get back to, okay? We, we see this in these scriptures that we've just read. Uh, there's a couple clues here that show us that Isaiah is talking about the future. He's not talking about the present. The first one is the degree of what's going on right here. It's not just Jerusalem. It's not just here. It's not just there. It is broad. It's all encompassing. The ruin and the devastation he's talking about will have been endured for generations and that's going to be reversed. Okay? That's going to be to no single region is identified. So this is telling us this is going to be widespread restoration, okay? That's hope. Um human history Rife with war has seen nations and cities repeatedly overrun and crushed. But in the future age, we're not going to have to worry about that, okay? It's going to be a complete restoration. The people of God will receive an unprecedented degree of respect. Do we see that now? It's getting worse, is it not? It's getting worse, okay? So we know he's not talking about now. He's talking about in the future right there, okay? He, he makes reference to aliens and foreigners serving the righteous. In verse 5, we talked about that. That's not that this is a punishment for the aliens and foreigners. It's saying, it's pointing out that God's favor is going to rest on his people, and he's going to place them in positions of leadership. He's going to restore. He's restoring everything. The second clue that we're talking about, the fulfillment of this passage is in the future, is the duration. Remember I pointed out to you a few minutes ago, he kept talking about everlasting joy, everlasting peace, everlasting, everlasting, everlasting. Okay. Well, we certainly, the hope that was granted to Israel when Israel became a nation again. Everybody thought, this is it. This is it right here. The Lord's coming back. Okay. Have we seen everlasting peace there? No, no, we haven't, okay? So we're talking about everlasting. When it reaches the point where we have this for everlasting, that's in the future, that's coming, okay? Um, and the, and the, the new heavens and the new earth is gonna be never ending. The joy of God's people, everlasting, okay? Um, certainly, we as followers of Christ experience joy serving him today, don't we? We experience joy, but that joy is intermingled with sorrows and trials, right? But there's coming a day, the new heavens and the new earth, when God restores everything, there's coming a day where we're, we're not going to have trials and tribulations and sorrows that are interrupting our joy. It's going to endure forever. Now, so we've got this promise Isaiah's talking about, you know, okay, here we're seeing Jesus came and he fulfilled this much, but he's going to come and fulfill the rest. We have that promise. That's what's going to happen. So now what is our choice? What do we do here? We have an invitation as to whether we're going to accept or reject what is taking place here. Let's jump over to the book of Isaiah chapter 65. I told y'all we're going to be jumping back and forth a little bit this morning. Isaiah chapter 65. Picking up, starting at verse 1. The first thing we're going to talk about is judgment on those who reject. We have an opportunity to accept his way of life or reject his way of life. Okay? All right. 
1 through 7, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually. Does any of this sound familiar? Sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat as in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities, your father's iniquities, together, says the Lord, because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me in the hills, I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. Have you ever driven by? I know you have because we've had it in Butler. Have you ever driven by a street corner and seen somebody that was holding a sign that says, hellfire and brimstone. Turn or burn. Okay. That's between them and the Lord. If God's told them to do that, I'm not stepping on them. Okay. As a believer, what's your reaction when you see that? I don't think that's showing grace and mercy and love. Okay. I think it's showing they're condemning them. Okay. Yeah. All right. They're not going to draw in a conviction. Nobody's going to be running toward them, are they? <laughs> okay. So you you hit the nail on the head, Becky, when you said. Um, it's not showing mercy. It's not showing love, okay? Jesus is both. And this is what Isaiah is pointing out, okay? We just read in chapter 61, we just read of his mercy, of his grace, of his restoring power, of what he's going to do. But right here in, ver in chapter 65, he's saying, I'm going to repay, my judgment is coming, okay? So it's, it's got to be a balance. It's got to be a, a balance there. Uh, verse, chapter 65 confronts us with a God of judgment who's also a God of mercy. We have to have both sides. The, the, these characteristics of God exist simultaneously or at the same time, okay? It's, it's a heartbreaking tragedy to realize that Isaiah was writing about God's desire to bring his own people into covenant with him, and they were still rejecting him. They were still rejecting him. We are living in a moment where we are, you know, I'm not going to get on a stump this morning because it's a totally different topic, but we could sit here and debate, is there going to, you know, what about the great falling away? Do you believe there's going to be a great end time revival? And we can sit here and we can debate that and we could pull out scriptures from everywhere to probably support both sides as to what, is, what we think is going to happen right here. Okay, the tragedy is, you put all that aside, the tragedy is we have people today that the Lord is reaching out to. He's giving an opportunity. He's extending an invitation. He's sent words forth. And we have people today who are walking away and intentionally rejecting that. I am seeing, I'm seeing in our own community, people who have followed the Lord, loved the Lord, uh, and for all practical purposes were true and faithful and 100% sold out to Jesus Christ. I'm watching them walk away. I'm watching them walk away from Jesus Christ in the midst of this turmoil that's going on. How tragic is this. We're seeing the same thing that Isaiah was seeing right here. It should be grieving us. It should, it should be making us all the more hungry to try to reach out and, and to, to give people hope, give them, give them um, Jesus all over again. You know, uh, Romans 5, 8, Paul says, God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew the state that we were going to be in, and still he offers an opportunity, okay? We, we have just seen in, in uh, chapter 61, we've just seen where he's offering all this. He's laying this out. This is what I'm giving to you, but he comes back in verse 65 and, it, and shows us that, unfortunately, there's going to be people who are still going to reject God, 
no matter how many times they've been invited to enter into a relationship with him, no matter how many times he has forgiven them and welcomed them back, with open arms, there's still going to be people that are going to reject, okay? Now, the verses that we just read, like verses 3 through 7, right, right through there, are describing some things that we see in the world today. What was going on, okay? They were communicating with the dead. They were offering pagan sacrifices. They were disobeying God's commands. They were going specifically against the law. What are we seeing happening in our world today? Same thing. The very same thing, Papa. The very same thing is going on, okay? And now the reference that you made right there about if God doesn't judge America, then he needs to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is really sitting here ensuring that that's not going to happen. This scripture is saying the same thing that happened to them for rejecting is going to happen to you for rejecting, okay? Because he is a just God. So we have a choice, we have a choice right here. Are we going to accept Jesus Christ? Or are we going to reject Jesus Christ? The promise of judgment, like verse 7, he says what? Full full payment. I think, yeah, I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. The promise of that judgment is just as direct as the invitation that God is giving, saying, here's a way out. Does that make sense? Um, uh, Romans 6, 23, Paul says the wages of sin is death but but what the gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus our lord so when it comes back to that scenario we were saying that the people that are going to stand with the turn or burn or you know hellfire and brimstone they're only showing the judgment of god okay what does scripture tell us it's the kindness lord it's your kindness that leads me to repentance there's a time for hellfire and brimstone Papa, I believe you've talked about being saved under one of those hellfire brimstone messages. You know, it's like sometimes a person just needs to, their, their socks scared off of them and to realize what is coming. But we have to balance that with mercy and with love and with grace. And this is what is happening here. And this is what Paul's reminding us in, in Romans 6, 23 is, yes, the wages of sin is death. If you do not accept what Jesus Christ has to offer you, you're going to be punished with death. In his timing, okay? But, but the gift of God is eternal life, okay? You know, John 10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy's going to attack you. He's going to attack you. But Jesus says, I am calm that you might have life and more abundantly. So he makes a way of escape. He always makes a way of escape, okay? So we're balancing this coin. If you do not accept, if you reject what Jesus is offering you, punishment will come. The wages of sin is death. But blessings are going to come for those who accept, okay? Jump back to Isaiah 62, verses 10 through 12. He says, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out a city not forsaken. A lot of times we're going to see Isaiah and other prophets in the, in the word of God uh, use Zion or Jerusalem as the setting for what's going on. And, and they use it to direct attention to God's saving work among the rede redeemed. And so when he's saying here, the, the people are invited to come through the gates where he's saying, come through the gates. He's referring to Jerusalem, but that's not really what he's talking about. He's talking about come into who? Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the gate. What does he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the gate. He is the gate right here. Okay, security and blessing can be found only where? In Jesus, in the Savior, okay? And, and so this is, this is like reference, making a reference to that, okay? 
Um, and then Isaiah 65, where we were, we're going to jump back over to Isaiah 65 again. We're going uh, to verses uh, 17 this time. Fixing to jump over there. Just, just mark it. I think I'm getting ahead of myself here just a second. But um, Isaiah, Isaiah expands the promise of blessing beyond the city of Jerusalem. We talked about that a minute ago. Beyond the land of Israel, okay? He's, ex he's expanding it to the entire world. And if we, if we go back through and read all those verses again, like verses 1 through 7, and we talk about all the things that the nation of Israel was doing, the idolatry that they were involved in, the paganism that they were involved in, all the disobedience that they were... You know, we said a minute ago, it's like looking at the United States today. So much of this study in Isaiah, and then uh, those of you ladies that were doing the... the uh, devotion where we were reading through the scripture and we, we hit Jeremiah and we hit Jeremiah at just the time when it was so critical what was going on in the U.S. and it was like a parallel. You could just see, you know, what, what was taking place right there. Um, and we've talked many times that, you know, when these lessons were planned out these and written, these people had no idea that it was going to fall today and what's going on in our world, okay? But, but when we look at what was going on in the nation of Israel and we compare it to what's going on in our, in our world today, it's almost a parallel running right there, okay? But the, but the hope that is brought up um, is that, again, what do, we, what do we read back in chapter 61 and chapter 62? That the Lord is going to bring what? He's going to bring beauty for ashes, He's going to come back, and for those who are choosing to serve him, for those who accept what he has, okay, there's going to be a total transformation. How many of you have ever seen the power of redemption in somebody's life? I mean, like, night and day difference in somebody's life. You know, I have, I have seen the Lord take an alcoholic abuser, okay, and turn that person into the best husband you could ever imagine because the Lord got a hold of him. The Holy Spirit got a hold of him and transformed him, okay? Jen, you've experienced this in your whole life. And I remember maybe three or four months after you gave your heart to the Lord, somebody talking to me, and I know they talked to you, but somebody talking to me saying, I cannot believe the countenance change on her face since she's given her heart to the Lord, totally turn around and go the opposite direction, okay? And this is what is, is happening here. We, we experience a little bit of that when we give our heart to the Lord, but, but Isaiah's talking about a time when there's going to be total transformation of all of this, and that's going to be available to those of us who will accept, okay, what, what Christ is offering right here, okay? Here's a statement for you. Tell me if you agree or disagree with this. We can review the large-scale history of our city or of our nation, and we can recognize the difference made when God is honored and when he's not. Your historians are not going to agree with you over that, but you can look back and see. You can look back in our nation's history and you can see what was happening and you can pretty much tell. If you didn't even know who was in, in the White House, who was in Congress, or anything, you can pretty much tell the, that nation was honoring the Lord right then or that nation was not honoring the Lord right then. Okay? The power of redemption in our lives can radically change our environment. As Christians... If we want to affect change in our society, we have to live out the life that Christ has called us to do. One of our missionaries posted, and I, I can't quote exactly how he posted it, but he, he was saying, basically, we need to look up the Beatitudes, and we need to start living according to the Beatitudes if we want to affect change in our world. 100% sell out. Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, me and my wife sat there and I was listening like that. <clears throat> and I made a comment, you know, about our nation. I hit it far as Palestine. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. She's She don't know what that is. So God's going to take care of your feet. Uh-huh. He's going to have somebody, someone, a group, and get out of children. I, I talk about our grandchildren, what they're going to play, you know. Uh-huh. Now my son's affecting his children. And I worry about that. But she just, she can't worry about that. we got to keep out the focus for what? Truth. That's right. He's going to take care of you. That's right. He brought my dad years ago. Mm-hmm. Your, your, your generation, generation. Yes. But it's hard to do. You have to read it. We have to stay on our knees, Papa. And, and we have to go back to, again, I got to be kingdom-minded. I got to recognize that, that Jesus is bringing about something here. And it's not about me. And it's not about you. Is a much bigger purpose. It's a much bigger plan, okay? If we are faithful, you know, we did our study in the book of Revelation, and it kept coming back as we were studying the seven churches and the letters to the seven churches. It kept coming back to what? To him that overcometh will be given, okay? So, Papa, we got to be the ones that overcome. And we got to teach our children how to overcome. We got to teach our grandchildren how to overcome. And how do we do that? By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, okay? By, by staying heavenly minded, by staying kingdom minded, kingdom minded, okay? So, as, as we're wa- wrapping this up today, and I told you to turn to verses 17 through 19 of Isaiah 65, he says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or even come to mind. Wow. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. And as you continue to read that that chapter there, he's talking about the, the, the promises that he's going to give us. Okay, Everlasting joy for God's people. Back in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, when God is creating the, wor- the, the world, okay? okay, repeatedly, like six times, we see that God said it was good. It was good. It was very good, okay, when, when he created man. There's no reference in Genesis there to pain, sorrow, wickedness, sickness, you know, But all we have to do is, with a flick of a button, turn on or turn on our phone, or we have devastating, horrific news with the touch of a finger. You know, I heard a preacher say one time that you know why people are so tied up in knots and so worried and anxious all the time? Because never in the the history of our world before have you had such horrible news in your back pocket. Everywhere you go, you cannot escape it. And we seek it out. Unfortunately, we seek it out, okay? But it it doesn't take long. Just a push of a button, either on your TV, on your phone, on your iPad, your computer, and we can see what has happened because sin entered the picture, okay? But we have to be reminded that evil is only temporary, And it may seem like it's controlling everything right now, but it's not. God has not relinquished his authority. He is still on the throne. He's still going to bring about the word that he he is sharing with us even today. Okay? The creation narrative reminds us that God's plan for the original heavens and earth was good. It was good. The future heavens and earth are going to fulfill that intention. That's ultimately where we're going. It's going to be good again. It's going to be as God intended it, okay? So we, we, ha- we have to realize that so much of what is going on that's painful in our world today, we have to recognize that that's a result of sin. That, that's, that's what it is, okay? End time prophecy, including Isaiah that we've been studying for these last few weeks, points to the eventual defeat and removal of sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I can get excited about that. But I need to make sure I'm on the right side. 
I need to make sure that I'm accepting what he's offering, okay? Verse 17 here, when he says, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come even come into mind. What that describes, that such a radical transformation in creation, okay? Just think about it being so, so good. If you continue on in this passage, we're going we're gonna to read about how the lion will lay down with the lamb. Okay? How things that, that are not normal in, in our world today, how we're going to begin to see that those things will come to pass because it's going to be such a radical transformation. Now, we can sit here today and I can ask you what you think heaven's going to be like. And we're going to have every how many peoples in here, we're going to have that many different opinions about what heaven's going to be like. Sometimes we base those things off of biblical passages, but sometimes we base them off of movies that we've watched, songs that we hear, you know, all these things that kind of play in our perceptions. We've talked about this in our Jonah Bible study, how your world perception will determine how you even read scripture. And it'll determine how you, how you interpret scripture by according to what your perceptions are. But we have this perception of what we think heaven's going to be like because of a song we sang or a movie we watched or something like that, okay? It comes down to scripture offers the only sure guide as to what God tells us about eternity. And here's what we know. You ready? Here's what we know. The new heavens and the new earth are going to reflect his ultimate plan for his creation. I don't know what that looks like. You don't know what that looks like, okay? But it's his ultimate plan, and it's gonna be good, okay? It's gonna be good. The overall focus of these verses is consistent with God's ultimate plan for his redeemed people. The emphasis is on life and blessing and peace. The absence of conflict. We're not gonna have fear anymore, just think about that. Just think about that. Regardless of streets of gold and gates of pearl and, you know, regardless of all of that, just think, just think about this, okay? God's blessings will be poured out on all generations. We're going to see it happening and that things are going to be restored. Things are going to be totally transformed, totally new, Okay. So what is God saying to us? We need to live our life in light of that. Okay? We have to hold on to the promises of God. We have to hold on to the fact that he's going to take care of us, Papa. Regardless of what's fixing to cut loose here or when or what, he's going to take care of us. Okay? But we also have to look at that that promise in light of today's responsibilities. We still live in this world. We have jobs in this world. We have families in this world. We have to have food to eat. We, ha you know, we, have, to, we have to take care of what God has given us right here. I remember the parable in Luke chapter 10 where the ruler was going away and he calls his servants together and he gives them, you know, here's you this and here's you this and here's you this now. If, if you remember the, the parable of the talents, you will remember that one servant took it out and doubled his servant's money. Another servant took it out. He was given less, but he still doubled his servant's money. And then there was a servant that said, well, you know, I knew you like your stuff, and so I hid it. I didn't want anything to happen to it, so I hid it. And that was the servant that the landowner cursed. Okay. He didn't occupy. He did not occupy. We, we have to understand. When Jesus is talking to us and he said at the Last Supper, he said, you know, I go to prepare a place for you and I'm going to surely come back and get you and take you to be with me so that where I am, you're going to be there offer, uh, also. But he also followed that passage of scripture up and that's in John chapter 14 if you want to go look it up. He also follows that passage up by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he's going to prune it so it will be even more faithful, more fruitful. What are we talking about right here? Okay, we're talking about that as we walk with God, 
as we live through all this craziness that's going on, we have an obligation. Although we're not of this world, our world is to come, the new heavens and the earth, but we still should what? We have to occupy. We are to occupy. That's what he says. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. He says, engage in business till I come. Occupy until I come. We have a job to do. We're not supposed to just be walking around saying, you know, I've heard this too, Jim. We were talking about comments that are out there. I've heard this too. Well, y'all quit worrying. The Lord's taking us on out of here. Well, yes, he's going to take us out of here, but I have responsibilities while I'm here. And that responsibility is to grow the kingdom. I'm supposed to be fruitful. I'm supposed to multiply. I'm, I'm supposed to be productive while I'm here. I have to occupy. As we walk with God, we should see ourselves becoming productive branches within the vine joyfully awaiting that day when his kingdom's going to be revealed. We have a hope. We have a blessed hope. We're looking for that day. What a day that's going to be when we have no more sorrow, when we have no more turmoil, when we have no more pain and no more sickness. What an awesome day that's going to be when the lion can lay down with the lamb and when it's perfected like Jesus intended for it to be from the very beginning. That day is coming and we've got that promise. But until it gets here, we had to be productive members of society. Not this society, the kingdom, the kingdom, okay? So what do we need to do? I'm going to challenge you this morning. All of you, go back and read the Beatitudes. Go back and read the Beatitudes this week, okay? And then ask yourself, am I lining up? Am I lining up? I could also tell you to go to the book of Galatians and read the fruit of the Spirit. Are we lining up? We are going to need the fruit of the Spirit more tomorrow than we do today. And more the next day than we do tomorrow. Okay? We have a hope. We're not of this world. But we also should occupy until he comes. Amen? Amen. Thank y'all for being here this morning. Thank y'all for being here this morning. And like I said, next week we're going to start uh, into a new... I'll, I'll post the... Uh, the Bible study on there for those of you that do not have books, but we're going into the Gospel of Mark. We're going to pick up with Mark chapter 1 uh, next Sunday. So talking about Jesus' ministry, and that's going to be a really good study. I'm looking forward to that. So God bless you. If you have Sunday school offering, you haven't given it yet, the bowl is up front. God bless you. We love y'all. Bye-bye.